thanks for joining us, everybody. I appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, I'm going to share this with, with you guys when it's over too. So I know Audrey mentioned we were going to be recording it for some potentially some social media use, but um, I'll also send it to you guys in case you want to use it for anything like that. Um, so I think real quick, I'll just introduce myself why I'm here and then really let you guys start talking. That's really the point of this. Um, my name is Jeremy Kaniski. Uh, I've worked in emerging tech type stuff for about 15, 16 years now, mostly like in the education entertainment space, building like interactive projects for and exhibits for museums and zoos and things like that. Um, I've worked with Jack and the Horner Science Group on a few projects over the years um, and, and specifically kind of have helped them uh, produce this current NFT origin project that we uh, that we released and that you guys are a part of. So. Um, Thanks for allowing me to moderate for, for you guys and appreciate all of you joining uh, joining us tonight. And sorry, TM, in your case, uh, early in the morning, I think, right? Um, wow, okay. Cool. So, um, you know, I, I'm gonna start just by introducing all of you. Probably needs no introduction, um, but we have Jack here, Jack Horner, the of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World fame and probably seen a lot of his TED Talks and things like that. Um, Jack is the Regents Professor of Paleontology Emeritus at Montana State University and also a Presidential Fellow at Chapman University. Uh, he's also a MacArthur Fellow and a National Geographic Explorer. And so uh, I, I think really what's going to happen here is you guys are going to uh, start talking and asking questions of Jack around some of these dinosaurs and, and the looks of them, things like that. Uh, so Jack, thanks for joining us today. Um, and then we have Dr. Linda Silver. Uh, Linda is the Eugene McDermott CEO of the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm in San Antonio, so you're right up the road. Me and I've been to your place, it's awesome. Um, Perot actually just today has taken delivery of the full-bodied feathered Tyrannosaurus uh, that, that Jack and, and the paleo artist Fabio Pastori put together. Um, so Dr. Silver, thank you for joining us. Uh, we also then have Dr. Kate Carter, Director of Science Communication at the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science in Miami, Florida. Um, Frost Science was actually the first museum to accept uh, this one of these donations from us. Uh, and, you know, when Audrey told me that you guys had accepted it with all of the technology and crypto stuff that's happening in Miami, I, I kind of wasn't surprised that it was a, a place in Miami that took it. Um, you guys also took a T-Rex. You took the T-Rex scavenger head, which has the, the comb-like thing that I'm sure you guys will talk about with Jack here. Um, and so, Dr. Carter, thanks for joining us. Uh, and then last, certainly not least, um, Dr. TM, Dr. Dr. Lim, is that proper or TM? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Lim is my family name, yes. Uh, thanks. Uh, is the CEO at the Science Center Singapore uh, and also Associate Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at National University of Singapore. Uh, and right. so Science Center Singapore selected um, uh, another iconic, I, I think one of my favorite, probably my favorite uh, images, which is the one you see behind here, behind me and Jack, yes. um, which is the, the golden triceratops. Yes. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us today too. Um, so really, again, the purpose today is really for you guys to take turns asking Jack some questions about his theories around these dinosaurs and, and kind of particularly maybe how they're described in this art collection. Um, and, and, and also, you know, this isn't going to be a prompted question, but if you have anything you want to share about why you took the the NFT donation or what you plan to do with it or anything like that, please feel free to do that too. Um, and so Dr. Silver, I think you're particularly under a, a time crunch. So I'm gonna let you go first and I'll let you kick it off. Sounds great. Well, Dr. Horner, it is such an honor to see you again. And you won't remember this, but I met you about 25 years ago at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County when you were doing a book signing for us. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, I was early in my career and you were so inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a high level question because what I love about this project is how it marries art and science together in this new and novel way that's also reflective of the true nature of science and history of science. So I'd love to hear from you about this pairing of art and science and why you think it's important. Well, I, uh, first and first and foremost, you know, you know I have always, I, I, I've always had a, a, a close, close affiliation with artists and, and, and I've, you know, my research is, is is really aimed aimed at, at you know 
it's scientific, obviously, but but it's aimed at at the, at the public, and and always has has been uh, through museums or through my books or or whatever. And and this project with Fabio is really you know it came it came about mostly just just because of of you know all the crazy notions of that, that people are you know. Are bound up in, the, in this notion that dinosaurs look like there's, you know, what we see in the, mo- the movies, and 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 you know, you know, I just one of the it, it, it was for a paradigm shift, and and the best way to get you know the the best to do that is either you you have to, you know create a new movie, or you you have to find. You know, if, if if you can't, you know, if you can't talk people in, you know, like Spielberg into making to make colorful dinosaurs or make dinosaurs, you know, as scientific as, as as we know them accurately to look like, we, we you know, you know, you're you're kind of stuck, and 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 you're stuck because you know, not very many, you know, science science in general, the 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 media platforms for scientists are, are small, and, and and you know our we have our museums and, and we do our best to edu- educate, but you know when you get when you get right down, you know, you know nothing compares to a, I mean the movie is you know so gigantic compared to to we can you know we can educate the public any other other way that. You know, so, so we, we started trying to, to figure out how it would be possible possible to to get you know these this these new ideas out to you know a lot of people people and and and, and so, so you know we, we we came up with the, the whole idea of, of of working with Jeremy and 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 you know doing the NFT project. Um, and along with it, you know, Fabio and I are trying to put together a book, and we're and and we're you know working with with uh, you know some of the media media is trying to just trying to find a whole bunch whole bunch of differences, kind of to, to just try to swap, you know the, the public like with, with this new idea of sorts. I don't maybe it'll work. <laughs> it's, it's hard to tell. Perfect. Um, so here at the Pro Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, we are, like our colleagues, very committed to sparking the curiosity of the next generation of scientists. And I'm interested in understanding what you think the future role of these NFTs are in science education. Well, first off, I think if you put it out on the on on the floor for this for kids to see, they're gonna they're going to have all kinds of things to say about it. I mean, it's, it is not Jurassic Park. It is not a Jurassic Park dinosaur. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's almost pretty, right? And there are a whole bunch of kids and I, you know, not to be sexist or anything, but I can tell you there are a whole bunch of eight-year-old boys who are not going to want their T-Rex to be pretty. Oh, you know, you there's that to deal with, and 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 I, you know, I my ideas of T Rex are, you know, really, you know, out out. I, I I I have serious, you know, arguments with little kids about what how T Rex got its meat, and you know, and I I'm pretty sure it was a scavenger and or at least an opportunist of some sort, and. And uh, and so, you know, we we can use that. We can use the new T Rex for for you know a, a way to bring up that conversation. Um, you know, there. I, I'm not. I'm not certain what. Um, well, I am. I I think. I think your very own paleontologist would probably argue about, you know, what I think the role of a T-Rex is. So, so I'm sure, you know, that would be a conversation unto itself. Um, 
but but I think I think what's cool about the NFTs is is that you know this you know if you want to make a scientific argument about it you, you want to use it scientifically consider the fact that you know that first off as we all know birds are the descendants of dinosaurs and 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 when when you think about you know the coloration and the and the kind of animals that dinosaurs have come to be portrayed as as we see in the movies they really you know Spielberg really wanted them to have the reptilian look and st- and yet big animals that have zero color to them, right? So he wanted, you know, I tried to get Spielberg to make colorful dinosaurs and he said, no, you know, technicolor dinosaurs aren't scary enough. So he wanted them scary. He wanted them reptilian-like and, and yet, um, you know, he... He was still trying. He, he still wanted them to be dinosaurs, right? But his idea of of dinosaurs, like many other people's idea of dinosaurs, is that they're big animals, and big animals are gray or brown, right? Not realizing that you know he's talking about mammals. You know he's talking about big mammals. And mammals evolved as nocturnal creatures. They're almost all colorblind. They don't see color. But reptiles, you know, sauropsids are, are you know, visual animals, all of them, including birds, right? And so, and so they interact. They, they interact visually. And, they, and so, yes, you know, you can have gray reptiles and you can have brown reptiles. But you can also have vividly colored reptiles, and you don't have any vividly colored mammals unless you know unless we get into the primates and specifically into baboons that you know has a has a face and a butt that's that's colorful. But that's about it. I mean, as far as mammals go. So, so what I you know what I wanted people to see is is you know that dinosaurs gave rise to birds, that they really are reptilian, they gave rise to birds, they should be vividly colored, not just drab colors. And they also, you know, like birds, um, should be colored, you know, if, if you look at if you look at the crested birds, the birds that have bony crests on their heads, those bony crests are are vividly colored. I mean, they're they're covered with keratin and they're vividly colored, and we know that the that the accoutrements, the bony structures on dinosaurs, were also covered with keratin. We know that the entire face of, of Triceratops was covered with keratin. So there's no reason not to make it vividly colorful, just like like birds. So I mean, that's that's a lot of things we can talk about when it comes to you know, these dinosaurs and especially you know dinosaurs like t-rex make it i think we're, we're all going to have to rethink our exhibit halls now we've well, all got gray and brown t-rex that's a good idea <laughs> i think that's a great idea <laughs> thank you for answering my questions thanks dr silver appreciate it um so kate i think we'll move on to you and uh any questions you might have for jack Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. We're so excited. We are going to put this NFT on display, um, and we're um, we're we're kind of working to develop a lot of exhibition content around it. Um, so we took the Tyrannosaurus skull, um, and it is such a unique interpretation. Um, and there are a lot of interesting soft tissue features, like the waddle and the comb, on the Tyrannosaurus. So I was interested in hearing some of your inspiration for that morphology and what what inspires it well let me just say that you know if you ever look at a tyrannosaurus rex skull if you you look at a t-rex skull there's something going on on its nose and nobody ever puts anything on it i mean 
it is a gnarly looking thing. It's gnarly looking. It's got holes in it. It's got, there's something. And I have, you know, done the histology on it. I've cut those bones and, and there's a lot of what we call Sharpie's fibers, which means something is attached to it. And, and, you know, I, my notion that, that T-Rex is, you know, is an opportunist or a scavenger kind of led me to, to, you know, consider the fact that sitting up on its nose is some kind of a, a comb-like structure, like the, like we see in in uh, condors. Some of the condors have have these fleshy-looking comb-like structures. So, thought that'd be really cool on a T. Rex because something is there. And as far as waddles and things like that, that go, you know, we see that on on virtually, you know, on many birds. Have have waddles and and as I was saying before, you know, birds birds display with their heads, right? I mean, that's peacock different, right? He's, your male peacock is going to display with its feathers, but for the most part, you know, go to the Singapore, you know, the the bird park in in singapore and you can you can see all these beautiful birds with crests on their heads and they all have waddly looking things you can i mean they've got they're they're displaying with their faces and so i think the dinosaurs were doing the same thing there's 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 a precedent dinosaurs are more closely related to birds than they are to anything else including all the rest of the reptiles so so they should look more like birds. They should be doing things more like birds are. I mean, and all these giant cranial features that they have, including T-Rex with its, you know, T-Rex had had little spiky things over its eyes and, and, and then, you know, evidence of something on its nose. And so, you know, I, I think we, I think these animals were just a lot more extravagant they had a lot more extravagant display features than than we normally put on it on any of these animals. I think we've just been way, way, way too conservative when we think about how how elaborate their their display features are. I mean, they you know the horned dinosaurs just you know evolved these gigantic display features, and 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 then we go and make them gray. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. But I think it's time that you know that yeah we we got the dinosaurs out of the color closet right and brighten them up you know start start make, start making them look like like spectacular animals that they were. Does that does that answer your question? Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much. You good to go, Kate? Any other questions you wanted to follow oh, up? Or? Sure, I didn't know if we were rotating or, but yes, um, in fact, related to what you are what you were talking about, um, one of the things that I've been really interested in, in reading um, is about the kind of ongoing debate about Tyrannosaurus social systems. So the people that say kind of it's a solitary animal versus those that, that say that it um, lives in kind of multi-level complex dynamic social groups. So what do you think about this discussion? Is there evidence that you find most salient? And what would you think we would need in order to kind of come down on one side or the other? Well, first off, I, th I, first off, I think that we have good evidence that all of the dinosaurs were highly social. And, and, and in fact, in fact, and, and especially the, the the dinosaurs from the late Jurassic and all of the Cretaceous period, they have you know, all of these display features. They show uh, a lot of, of change during their ontogeny, their growth, right? Juveniles look different than adults. I mean, they they have all of the characteristics that we see in very social animals. And and especially socialized birds, right? The social, the the features that we 
we attribute to social behaviors in birds, we see in dinosaurs. The juveniles look different than the adults and that they retain those juvenile characteristics until they're almost full grown. And then we start seeing, you know, the crest start to grow and the shield starts to grow, the horns start to develop more, they change shape, they do all sorts of things. And these are all indications of social behavior, including parental care. And so, you know, the, the idea of uh, tyrannosaurs being social or being, you know, solitary, I think is, is just completely bogus. You know, it's, it's, it's based on the fact that, you know, when we find a skeleton, they're usually by themselves. But that's, you know, true of, you know, us as well, right? <laughs> you should find a, <laughs> think about just, you know, that's how we find, you know, not very often that animals die together. And when they do, it's a catastrophic event. And every catastrophic event where we have found dinosaurs, we found them together. They're in a lot of dinosaurs in herds and groups. And we have found tyrannosaurs in groups that appear to have died catastrophically. So, so yes, I, I just, they're, they're definitely social animals. Awesome, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, TM, I know you had a couple questions that you had sent over. I, I know maybe partially one of them might've been answered um, already, yes. but please feel yes. free to. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Jack for your generous donation and uh, about almost 20 years ago we had the honor of hosting you at the Science Center Singapore when we organized the uh, T-Rex Sue and Friends. Uh, at the time yeah. I wasn't at the Science Center yeah I was actually a wise dean of science in the Faculty of Science uh, but we collaborated with the Science Center uh, so uh, we also met you and, and really it's a great honor and thank you thank you for this gift. Uh, um, we chose the uh, iconic as, as what Jeremy said, uh, and I'm so happy to see that, that, that picture behind Jeremy and, and so next to you, uh, Jack, that, that Triceratops skull. Uh, we, we chose it because it is so, so iconic. And uh, my question is in a way related and is part of what uh, the, the earlier answers you had, especially when you gave to uh, Linda and, and partly to Kate. Uh, I, I love the hypothesis that, that dinosaurs uh, are in a way like giant birds. And as, as you alluded, at our bird park, we have all kinds of giant birds. They are very colorful and, and indeed uh, the face and, and the structures are like what you hypothesize. My, my question is, uh, first question is, uh, what would be the definitive uh, uh, so-called evidence or clues that the paleontologists could find from the field? Uh, because I, I, I suspect it might be quite difficult to find uh, fossilized uh, uh, specimen containing pigment cells. So, so how do we go about finding that if, if there is a way? Well, ac actually, we do find uh, pigment cells um, uh, with a number of dinosaurs. And, and the ones that have been found, uh, especially the uh, small dinosaurs from China, where we are getting um, evidence, uh, we're, we're finding pigment cells, we are discovering that they were vividly colored. I mean, there, there is excellent evidence for that. And so, so um, the, the actual physical evidence that we're getting, plus the fact that, that, that we know that these, especially like Triceratops, the whole, you know, for a long time, people just kept making Triceratops with keratin sheath over its horns and over its beak. But we, you know, we know that that's not true. It's co the keratin covered the entire head. It, it was not around the cheeks and it wasn't around the eyes, obviously, or around the nose, but the shield, the horns, everything was covered with keratin and, or at least a very hard um, epidermal skin covering. So, so, you know, it's, we, we know that, that, that it had, a structure like that. And we also know uh, from indented blood vessels that go the entire length of the, of the uh, shield, we also know that there, 
was likely some kind of soft tissue structure attached to those accessory bones around the edges. And that's why I've chosen to have uh, Fabio make the soft tissue-like comb-like structures along the edge of the frill. We have very good evidence for that. And, and there's just no reason not to make them colorful if this, if this triceratops, I mean, the spell of a triceratops full grown is three meters long yes. and, two, and two meters wide. I mean, it is a gigantic palette. And it, you know, it, there's just, it just would be, you know, ludicrous to have it not be colorful since we see all birds that have these, you know, bony crests covered with keratin are all vividly colored. Yes, I mean, I, as, as the as zoologist, I, I, I agree with you. And, uh, and and that's one of the reasons why we chose this. I imagine this like big canvas. And uh, you mentioned about dark vessels uh, underlying and all that. Uh, and I suspect there could be also nerves. Uh, or even the blood vessels, yeah. they carry certain hormones. And you can imagine this big canvas changing color and expressing certain mood. And it, it, it'd be yes. quite exciting to imagine having face-to-face -face with the triceratops and with eyes and the mood expressing, it, it will be so exciting. I think this, this is something that we would uh, probably develop at, at our center, the narrative of how possibly they may communicate uh, with colorations and, and facial, even the angle of, of, of tilt and so on. Now, uh, my, my next question is, is going to do with uh, polymorphism, dimorphism, and, and, and so on. So uh, with, with colorful uh, features and all that, uh, I'm reminded of in, in the animal world, uh, there tend to be gender dimorphism. Uh, one yeah. gender appears to be more brilliant and colorful and, and so on. Uh, so how, how do you tell? I mean, are, are there enough evidence to show that uh, most dinosaurs or almost all dinosaurs uh, express some kind of uh, dimorphic features? Uh, because from the fossil bones, no. I, I wonder whether it is easy to deduce or not. No, unfortunately, we have we have done all sorts of studies, and we've never found evidence of of dimorphism in the skulls, which leads me to believe that it was probably all color. I I'm guessing that just like a lot of birds, the male and the female just had different color different colorations. Yeah, yes. I. Yes. We've yes. never found evidence. Never found evidence of sexual dimorphism. Yes, I, I think I think that could be also indirectly support, indirectly supporting the hypothesis of they have colors. Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, the the first visual thing is oh, that's a male, that's a female. I think that that is cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's really exciting. It, it, it's such an exciting uh, evolution of ideas and how we look at uh, this long lost animals and creatures, and, and if indeed they were really that colorful, I think the, the, the NFT brings us to that world and that imagination. And, and therefore, once again, I want to thank you, Jack, for, for this. You're and very so welcome. privileged to have it at Singapore. Thank you. Well, I, I love your museum. I, it's one of my favorite museums in the world. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for, for taking for taking the donations and, and I look forward to see what you do with them because, you know, 